Guys, if you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Revelation, and specifically chapter 4. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 4. Everybody go, "Uh uh-oh. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that, but you're going to have to wait just a few minutes, because while you're turning there, I'm going to remind you about the year that we're in. Last night, I was speaking at the Soak School, and yeah, it was a great a great time last night. It was just so powerful, and uh, not because I was there, but because the Holy Spirit was there. It's like, wow, I could feel the Holy Spirit as soon as I walked in there. Uh, The night before that, we were doing star parties out at Redemption Ranch for a great team of people. And guys, I promise you, I was just talking to Lenny and his beautiful bride, and what's real is they were saying, hey, we were out at the ranch, and we stepped into your cabin just to check it out, and man, the power of the Holy Spirit about knocked us down. Like, man, Jordan and Leanna had done some serious praying in this cabin. Yes, we have. Yeah, that's my, that's my prayer spot, man. Go out there and cry out to the Lord. Guys, we should be able to recognize the tangible presence of the Lord. Amen. Now, let me take you over for just a minute into a reminder of the timing that we're in right now. On the Hebrew calendar, friends, we are in the year 5784. Everybody say 84. And then on the Gregorian calendar, we're in the year 2024. Everybody say 24. Okay, as silly as that is, man, you need to know that when it comes to the calendar and when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to the Hebrew calendar, which is a lunar calendar that changes every 28 days, the the moon has a cycle the same as a woman has a cycle and it's every 28 days. That's why the moon is always seen as feminine and the sun is always seen as masculine. And when God Almighty speaks through the sun, he's talking to the nations. Whenever God Almighty uh, speaks through a sign in the moon, he is talking to covenant people and whenever King Jesus speaks through a sign in the stars he is talking to his children of inheritance amen now if you're going to take notes man I want to tell you you're going to do a lot of writing because I got a bunch of stuff to talk to y'all about amen are you guys up for this today I am too I'm excited about today so in the year 5784 one of the things that I like to do is I like to look and see what is the 84th verse of the Old Testament what's the 84th verse of the New Testament and see if there's not a prophetic theme that the Lord will reveal to us in that and whenever I looked at the year whenever I look at 5784 I'm actually looking at the 84th verse and it is Genesis 4 4 okay guys does anybody remember what the symbol of the number four is in the Bible. It's, it's a Dalit, that's exactly right. That is the letter. Now what is the symbol of it? It is an open door. This is the year of the open door, amen. And that ought to be really good news, open door church. Amen. Listen, when I, when I first started this church 28 years ago, I did it knowing that this was our year. No, I did not. I actually just opened up the book of Revelation. I looked at the seven churches and I was like, which one of those churches do I want our church to be like? And Philadelphia is what I landed on. Amen. The church of brotherly love, the church that helps people and loves people and blesses people. And that's the church that King Jesus says, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut. So I named the church Open Door. Amen. And then I thought, well, you know, this will only last a couple of months, so... But God had other plans. Man, he's good. Amen. So we know that the symbol for that is an open door. And the Genesis 4-4 is a double door. And it's the 84th verse. And it says that the Lord respected Abel and his offering. This is the year, as I've spoken unto you in, in days past, that in the midst of an altered state, we have to live at the altar. In a mist and in a time where everything is changing, we have to be all about the presence of the Lord. We have to be encounter people. Isn't, it, isn't this great that in the year 5784, that the word of God says that the Lord accepts Abel's offering. And then as we move into the year 2024, we move from Psalms 23 into Psalms 24, which is a throne room experience, amen? Psalms 23 is about God visiting you in the midst of all of your hell, and praise God for that. But Psalms 24 is about God pulling you up out of that hell and inviting you up into his mighty presence. It's one thing for God's presence to be with you. It's another thing for you to be with him. That's a whole different category. Amen. And that's the difference between Psalms 23 and Psalms 24. Now, does anybody remember what that scripture was? It was Genesis what? 4-4. Okay. 
So if we look over, where are there some 24s in the book of Revelation? The first 24 in the year 2024 is actually found in Revelation 4.4. So you have Genesis 4.4, and then you go 66 books later, and then you have Revelation 4.4. You have 84 connected to Genesis 4.4, and then you have 24 connected to, man, I don't know if you guys are listening to me. I'm preaching a whole lot better than the way y'all are looking at me right now. You're like, this brother is nuts. Hey, man, y'all ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Amen. I am nuts. I am a drop-dead, sold-out Jesus freak. I believe that God Almighty is speaking. Amen. And I'm excited about the day that we are living in. I'm excited about it. Like, I like this day. I was like, man, I don't like the day. I'm pining for the good old days. Well, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of things better in other days, and that's the fact, Jack. But I want to tell you, man, God Almighty could have had you born in any day, and he had you born in this day. He trusted you with this hour. You are anointed for this day. I'm telling you, man, you, you were born for such a time as this. You are anointed for this day. You've got this. Jesus is with you. Wow. I was looking at these verses and I was thinking about these things because this year is a really big deal. You know, the actual, the, the 24th verse or the 84th verse, I should say, in the New Testament, I was telling the, I was telling the soap class last night that it's Matthew 420. And it's like, what is that? It just says that the disciples immediately left their nets and they followed after him. I think that in this year, whether you're living by a Hebrew calendar because you're God's covenant people, or you're living by a Gregorian calendar, because you belong to the nations of the earth and Jesus Christ has redeemed you, amen? I would say that this is a great day for God to be able to expect of you that you're gonna drop what you're doing and get with whatever program to follow him he requires. It's like, King Jesus, I'm looking for a suddenly. I need a suddenly, Lord, I love suddenlies. And Jesus is like, I'm looking for it immediately. Amen. And so immediately they drop their nets. Man, I, I'm, I'm believing God for suddenlies. Man, you know what a suddenly is, amen? Anytime that scripture says, and suddenly, that means, dude, everything's changing on a, on a dime. Just changed on a dime. And you're like, whoa, that's the spirit of the Lord. But I think that also, too, a very mature thing for us to realize is that the Lord is going to speak to us and say, I need you to follow me in a way you never have before. And immediately we need to drop our nets and follow him. Immediately. Man, I want to walk with God like that. And I want the Lord to be able to trust me with things like that. So if you go into Revelation chapter 1, the Spirit of God visits Brother John on the island of Patmos. And then he turns to see the voice. How do you see a voice? Mm. I, 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 such good stuff. And then the Lord begins to speak to him. And in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, we have the epistles of Jesus. And we, you know, we all love the epistles of John and Paul and Peter and James. Man, we love those epistles. But do we know the epistles of Jesus? An epistle is a letter that you write to somebody and you understand that it's going to be used as curriculum for many other people. Right? Well, Jesus actually gave... I'm talking about from Jesus himself, not through an apostle, not through a disciple, but actually from the mouth of Jesus himself to the churches. Friends, we have to know Revelation chapter 2. We have to know Revelation chapter 3. And then God quits dealing with the church. And he turns his attention and his focus in chapter 5 to the nation of Israel. The eschatology of the nation of Israel is not the same as the eschatology of the church. And the book of Revelation it, it illustrates this over and over and over again. He has one covenant with Abraham for his people as a nation. And then he has another covenant with his bride through the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are the bride, you and I are the temple. Jesus is the defender of the nation of Israel, and he is coming back with his church to defend the nation of Israel. Amen. And I praise God for that. Those are good things. But 
you know, there's this crazy thing that happens when you like watch an old movie. And one of the cool things about you guys, you guys remember the, the Wizard of Oz, right? And it was a black and white. And it introduced the doctrine to this nation of, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Oh, bad stuff. I'm just telling you, that's not Jesus. <laughs> now that I've said all that, the movie itself was amazing. It was amazing. And it was full of wonder. Black and white, and then all of a sudden, it turns into color. And you can see the yellow brick road. Right? You guys remember that scene? It's like, whoa. It goes from black and white into color. That's exactly what happens in Revelation chapter 4. As we move from black and white into color, we move from Jesus dealing with John and the churches in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 to Revelation chapter 4. This is what it says. And after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. And immediately... I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I want to stop. You see that one? That's one of the titles of the Lord Jesus is the one. You see how it's a capital one? Yeah. So, and one sat on the throne. So whenever God Almighty tells the people of Israel that the Lord, your God is one, he's talking about Jesus. The Lord, your God is Jesus. That makes my Hebrew brothers mad. Like, don't tell us that. That's blasphemy. No, nope, that's the word of God. Amen. And someday Joseph will be revealed to his brethren. Amen. Amen. He will. And in the meantime, my Jewish brothers and sisters, repent and fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only one that's going to save you. Your hope is not in the temple, and your hope is not in the blood of bulls and goats and sheep. Your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and he loves you. Amen. That makes my Jewish friends really mad. But they're always mad at something anyway, so it's okay. It's the one. And then it says, and he who sat there was like a jasper, a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold upon their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Everybody say lightnings, thunderings, voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and the back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third was like a, that had the face of a man. And the fourth was like that of a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings with full eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is yet to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits upon the throne, who lives forever and ever, then the 24 elders, man, they fall down before him who sits upon the throne. And they worship him who lives forever and ever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and they were created. Man, heaven's a noisy place. Heaven's got all kinds of noise going on in it. The idea that everybody is going to be a, a fat little white baby sitting on a cloud in this peaceful, serene environment is not biblical. Man, there's all kinds of wild stuff going on in heaven. And, you know, to really understand what's going on here, and that, well, first of all, just understand this. You get a glimpse of the throne room and what it's like. It's like, man... Hey, man, I want to see the Titanic, but I want to go to the boiler room. I want to see all those gears. I want to see how hot it gets. I want to look at the boiler room and the Titanic. This is a throne room in heaven. 
And we go from God dealing with the church, King Jesus dealing with the church, him dealing with Paul's imprisonment on the island to, okay, just come up here and let's be done with that. And then boom. And what is this all about? How in the world are you going to have four living creatures with four different faces in the midst of the throne and around the throne? How does that work? Wait, how does that work? We don't know because you and I understand things in three dimensions, but we're not talking about a three-dimensional experience here. We're talking about a whole lot more dimensions. And so in the midst of all this, man, we got things going on in the midst, things going on above, things going on around. And what the heck are those cats with eyes? You got, and the Bible specifically says they have eyes behind them, they have eyes beside them, they have eyes in front of them. And every single time that they circle the throne, they see something that God did that was glorious. They see something that God is doing that was glorious. And they see something God is going to do that is glorious. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is yet to come. And they're just, they're just eyeball angels. I love me some eyeball angels. Eyeball angels. So yeah, man, you got these eyeball angels. And then you got these cats, these 24 elders. And you're like, okay, well, who are those? Mm. That's, a, and that's a great question. Guys, I'm finishing up my sermon series today that's called 24. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm thinking about these 24 elders a lot lately. Because one of the things that the 24 elders do and that you see associated with the number 24 in the word of God is the power of the repeat. Now we're not talking about hell's agenda. We're talking about heaven's agenda. And there are certain things in your life that God did that needs to keep happening and still needs to happen within the future. It's the power of the repeat. Now, in your own headlines, you've been hearing all about Hey, it's the repeat year, it's the repeat year, it's the repeat year, right? Everybody's scared to death or happy that it's the repeat year. Has anybody in here heard that besides me? Okay, so a couple of you have. If you haven't heard that, it's because you do not have your nose in a dadgum Twitter feed, which is great. <laughs> Amen. I've got a lot of social media, and I want to tell you, I don't like any of it. I just don't like it. I, I, I just, I'm disgusted at all of it anymore. I'm just like, man, to sit here and to scroll through this mess and have your head assaulted 24-7 and try and get you to join a mob, amen. I don't like it. The Spirit of the Lord is not in it. And so uh, I'm, I'm seeing this thing over and over and over again where people are like, it's all about the repeat. It's all about the repeat. You know, Kansas City won again, just like they did in 2020. And this was happening in 2020, and now this is happening here. And this happened in 2020, and now this is happening here. It's all about the repeat. 24 is about the repeat. It actually is about the repeat. So let's just kind of look and let's just unpack this for just a second. So you got these 24 elders around the throne in Revelation chapter 4. There's 24 of them. That's interesting because there's also 24 hours around a day, amen. There's 24,000 miles around the planet Earth. Remember guys, this book was written 2,000 years ago and the longitude problem was not solved until the 1800s. We didn't know how many miles around the world was until the 1800s. This was written 2,000 years ago and it says that 24 circles. The world is 24,000 miles around, friends, and also, my friends, there are 24 time zones on the planet Earth. The Earth turns at 1,000 miles an hour as it travels 66,000 miles around the sun, 66,000 miles an hour around the sun. And we're also spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, and in the midst of that, there are 24 time zones. So the Lord created all that so that we could actually map things out. And I love that. There's a guy by the name of John Harrison that solved the longitude problem. There's a great book on, it's actually just called Longitude. And if you want to know how all that was solved by the Royal Observatory, I've been to the Royal Observatory. I have seen his device that he used to map out longitude. And you know what it is? It's a clock. Like, what? 
Why would you map out land with a clock? Yeah, because time and space are in perfect continuum and you cannot separate it. So since the world is 24,000 miles around, John Harrison was like, all we gotta do to be able to map things out is to know what time it is. That's it. Like, how does that work? Well, we'll figure out what time it is in the middle of the ocean by if the sun is straight up or not. And we're gonna call that 12 o'clock. And then, but my clock has to be set according to Greenwich Mean Time, where the prime meridian is, where the line of time, and it was England's world, it was England's world, and they wanted to make the world England, so they said all time begins and ends in London, England, Greenwich Mean Time. And that's where the prime that's where the prime meridian is. So here's the deal. If I'm over here in Texas and I'm looking up and I'm going, okay, it is 12 o'clock right now. What time is it in England? Oh, it's five. That means I'm 5,000 miles away. That's it. That's all you had to be able to do to map out the world was be able to tell what time it was. And everybody knew that, but they couldn't figure out how to make a time clock work on a moving ship. And John Harrison was the guy who actually figured it all out. Like, why are you talking to me about time? Because Jesus Christ is gonna come back. And when he comes back, he ain't coming back to London, England. He's coming back to Jerusalem, Israel. And when he puts his foot on the ground, the ground splits and there's a new prime meridian where everything is measured from the earth and it's, and it's his throne, the throne of King David in Jerusalem, Israel. Amen. All time and all space will be measured according to the throne of King Jesus. <laughs> I told you I was crazy. So, these 24 elders around the throne, they are there. And they're crying out to God. And they are with these weirdo things that we don't even really know how to describe, except they're the eyeball angels. And by the way, they have four heads on their bodies. And by the way, <laughs> you know, one of them, <laughs> they're all weird heads too. And one of them is the face of a dude. In the midst of the face of a flying eagle, what's the difference between a flying eagle face and a sitting eagle face? Because I don't know. I don't really see much facial expressions on an eagle. <laughs> but this one has a face of a flying eagle. You know, it's like, I think it's screaming like a Comanche Indian is what I think it's doing. And so one of them's a calf, you know, what the heck, you know? And it's like, what is all this? This is just too weird. No, 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 you need to understand that when it comes to the 24 elders and when it comes to those that are around the throne, when it comes to that, we are dealing with the category of heavenly beings that the Old Testament calls Elohim. I'm gonna give you guys um, a description of the word Elohim here. And this, if you look it up in Strong's, it says the word Elohim is grammatically plural noun for gods or deities or various other words in biblical Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the ending M normally indicates a masculine plural. Okay, well, why do I need to know that? Because the word Elohim is typically just translated as God into your English Bible. But it doesn't necessarily mean Yahweh God. It means one of the gods. Like, whoa, stop, stop, stop. There's only one God. There's only one God we serve. But there are many gods, and Yahweh created all of them. So the whole understanding of gods is simply this, Elohim, it means spiritual beings. And in our Western world, we tend to think all spiritual beings are either angels or demons, but no, they're not. There's, heaven is proliferated with spiritual beings that God Almighty created, and some of them are fallen. Amen. Some of them are fallen, and some of them are still loyal to the Lord. So if you were gonna do a Google search and say, I wonder how many species there are on the planet Earth. We're talking about everything, you know, plant life, animal life, fish life, whole nine yards, you know, all those different kingdoms, right? And if we're gonna go through the different classifications, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, family, order, genius, and species. All right, let's just go to species. How many, how many species of dogs do y'all think that there are? Right? Some of y'all don't manage that, so you got 25 in, in your backyard, right? <laughs> so it's like, okay, 
So it's like, all right, so just, what about, what about dragonflies? I'm a huge dragonfly guy. I love dragonflies. I love butterflies. I'm a freak over butterflies. My boys make so much fun of me. Look out, y'all. Dad's going to stop looking at another butterfly. I'm like, you walk past it if you want to. That is a flying flower. It's a big deal, man. Like, I'm not walking past that. That thing is cool, man. I love butterflies. And so they're like, okay, how many species are there? Okay, if you did a Google search on it, depending upon which site you would go to, some say that there's 20 million species on the planet Earth. And then some say that there are as many as 50 million species on the planet Earth. And most of those are not yet discovered because we haven't mapped out the ocean yet. Okay, and remember, 70% of the planet is ocean. 70% while only 30% is land. So it's like, wow, up to 50 million species. Man, that is crazy. Here's what I wanna tell you. I promise you the heavens are much more populated than the earth is. And it doesn't all fall just into angels and demons categories. There's all this stuff that is in the Bible that we have never recognized that is in the Bible, but we've never recognized it in the church. I was just thinking yesterday, what kind of, what all, just within the angels that I can think of, there's seraphim, right? And they're also known as the burning ones. There's cherubim. They got these four faces and eyeballs. There's living creatures. There's the seven spirits before the throne. There's dominions and powers and principalities and rulers. And then there's angels. And within the angel category, there's actually warring angels and there's also messenger angels for the performance of the word, right? And then uh, there's guardians, there is uh, archangels, there are demons, there are gods. Let me just stop right there. Like, well, no, there's not. Yeah, there's, I was just thinking yesterday, Moloch, Bel, Dagon, Lilith, Chemosh, the queen of heaven, Uh, That's Jeremiah 7. Okay, so here's what the Bible says in Numbers 33, verse 4. Yahweh executed judgments against their gods. Okay, so guys, did Yahweh execute judgment against the gods of Egypt or not? Okay, so are there gods of Egypt? Oh. Yeah. There are. Azazel. Do you know that God commands Israel to make an offering to another God called Azazel? And it's one of my favorite offerings ever. He's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a lamb and I want you to make that as an offering unto me. And then I want you to get all the sin of the people and place it upon a goat, lay your hand upon it and send it out in the wilderness as an offering to Azazel. He gets the septic tank. That's in the, God commanded the Israelites to make an offering of a septic tank to Azazel. Like, well, it's just a metaphor. Uh, no, it's not just a metaphor. It's not. Because God Almighty created those little G-gods. We don't know what else to call them except for Elohim. And Elohim can be translated as God. But it actually just means heavenly family. And God Almighty is the Elohim over all the Elohim. He is the king over all the kings. He is the Lord over all the lords. Are you tracking with me on that? Like, well, I never heard anything like this. Well, that's because most folks are scared, and I'm not. This is a day where the lid is coming off all of this. Amen. As we are ramping up to the book of Revelation, the lid is coming off of all of this, and I love it. Then, of course, there's also the the devil. Like, he's not a demon. You have the devil. Um, By the way, if I can just stop and also just challenge you on this. Does anybody remember what the first commandment is? Okay. Does anybody remember what the first of the Ten Commandments are? All right. You shall have no other watch before me. Why would, okay. Hey, can can I tell you what? I'm going to give you a commandment that's not in the Bible. Thou shalt not step off the roof and fly around. (laughs) Why? Because you can't. But if the first of the Ten Commandments is, you shall not put any other gods before me, it means you can, and you better not. 
Amen. Listen, man, this whole world is full of little G gods that are so prideful and they hate your guts. Guys, there's also the sons of God, Genesis chapter six. There's the stars of God. And by the way, the sons of God means that they were supposed to receive an inheritance. They're in the angelic realm that you and I would call the angelic realm as Westerners, and they were supposed to receive an inheritance and they fell. Genesis chapter six, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, that they took unto them wives, and then they crossbred, and there were giants in those days. And afterward, talking about after the flood. Well, can I tell you this? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the return of the son of man. We're living in the days of Noah today. Is this too weird for you? Come on, you're, you're, you're so grown up, you can so handle this. Amen, you can. There's a lot more going on than what you think is going on. And what, the, what your media is gonna tell you is that God is getting further and further and further and further away and you can't find him anymore in the culture. I wanna just tell you this, everywhere I look, I'm seeing the Bible being played out now. And I'm like, wowzers, wowzers, man, look at that. That is crazy cool. So you have these cats, these, oh wait, as many as are led by the Spirit, he gives them power to be called the what? The sons of God. Do you know that Jesus Christ, when you fell, he offers you and I redemption, but he doesn't offer them redemption. And they hate your guts for that. And so now there's this like this replacement thing going on where you and I are now given the power to be called the sons of God, and you and I are receiving this inheritance that was once going to be given to God's heavenly family. And they fell out, and they rebelled, and too bad, so sad. And so if you, if you don't think they hate your guts, guys, do not partner with them. Remain loyal to King Jesus. Remain loyal to the Lord. Fear the Lord your God. Do not serve any other God. Do not serve any other God. Because the Lord doesn't offer redemption to them. He only, he offer, he only offers redemption to us. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> Aren't you glad for the blood of King Jesus? Yeah. All right. The Elohim is the heavenly family. And it's not always the word Yahweh. And heaven is proliferated with supernatural species. And that brings me to the 24 elders because I know that there's a lot of different theories on, well, I think it might be 12 apostles and I think it also might be the 12 tribes. Um, that's cool, um, but I don't think so. I have a ton of notes that I'm not gonna be able to get to on this subject, but I'm gonna give you my notes. If you guys go to odx.tv, and look up this sermon today, download my notes, and where I'm gonna send you to look at all this. Now, these 24 elders, um, they, wear, they wear white robes, um, they sit around the throne, they have crowns, they rule with King Jesus. The crowns speak of being a king, and then their white robes and them leading the song of redemption speaks of priesthood. So they are a special order within what you and I would call the heavenly realm that are both kings and priests, and they represent us in a tremendous way. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is yet to come. And they sing a song of redemption. So they're praise and worship leaders. And they represent the 24 time zones all around the planet Earth of the redeemed. Man, they're awesome and they're incredible and I love them. And the job of these divine beings is all about the repeat. So 24... It's about divine things that must repeat. Guys, can we put that on the screen, please? 24 is about the divine things that must repeat. It's the next thing that's on there. Thank you. This is what I want to leave you with. Because while many people are worried about, I'm afraid this, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And that, man, I want to tell you, there's no end of things for you to worry about if that's what you choose to do. Many people's hearts will fail them for fear because of the things that they see coming up on the earth. Don't let that be you. But this, the 24 elders are all about the repeat 
of the agenda of the throne of King Jesus. Yeah, the word lamb is in the book of Revelation 24 times. And all 24 times, the lamb is at the throne. So what are the things that you have seen happen that you need to see happen again and that need to continue in the future? What are those things? I wanna, you guys can go ahead and start playing if you would. I wanna tell you that recently I've become very aware and I'm waiting for my altar team to come up here. Come on guys. I told y'all I didn't wanna tell y'all to get up here. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't wanna stop and tell y'all to do stuff. I just wanna talk to my audience. <laughs> Everybody's so respectful of me that I know, sir, we don't want to interrupt you. So thank you. I'm very grateful for that. So I, I've recently become very, very, very aware that a repeat that is happening, a spirit has been unleashed that is not God. And there is a repeat that is happening within people's heads. And it's just like, I hear it over and over and over again that like Troy, it's like the plan, rewind, the plan, rewind, the plan, rewind, and I cannot get rid of it. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a devil is what that is. And a big part of it is, is that the spirit of hell wants you to be so demoralized. Do you know it's very important to hell that you are demoralized, that you can't move because of fear, that you can't move because you're disgusted and that you ultimately live in hopelessness. I heard um, Pastor Otis tell me this morning that hopelessness is about looking at your life without God in it. Hopelessness is about, I don't know exactly the phrase of that, but we have it up there somewhere. There it is. Hopelessness is contemplating your future without God in it. I went, Pastor Otis, that's brilliant. You should be so full of hope. And if the repeat that is in your heart and in your mind is not how good God has been to you, if the repeat is not the miracles that you've seen happen, the prayers that you have had answered, if the repeat causes regret or shame, that's a devil that's trying to kill you. It's a snake that is talking to you. Because around the, throne of King, around the throne of King Jesus is a constant eyesight that says, whoa, I see a whole new awesome thing, God, that you did for me that I have never seen before. My God, I see, I see something, God, that you're doing that I have never been able to recognize. I have hope for my future in a way that I've never had before. That's what's happening where the throne is. But if that's not happening within your mind and within your heart, there's something different happening there. And I want to tell you this, it wants to kill you. It is not your friend. I want to ask you to stand up if you would, please. Hallelujah. I will not be full of hopelessness. I will not be full of hopelessness. I will be full of hope. I will. I love you, Lord Jesus, and I praise you and I thank you, God, that you're here today. I say, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I praise you. God, we repent of our hopelessness. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I break the power of the repeat that is within people's lives that does not come from the throne. I curse the mouth and the voice that is speaking anxiety into people's lives. I rebuke the devourer in the name of King Jesus. Father, I bless you, Lord God. And God, right now, God, we turn away from these other gods. We turn away from the voices of these other gods. We will not serve another God, and we will not put another God before you. We will not heed the voice of another God when you, sir, are declaring something from your throne to us. Come on, Jesus. Friends, we're going we're gonna to worship here for a while. 
And here over the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to worship. And here, and let me tell you what needs to happen. If you have been fighting depression, if you have been fighting terrible thoughts, things that you don't even want people to know that you've been thinking, if you have been fighting this repeat of something that somebody has said or something that has happened and you can't get it out of your head, I want you to get out of your seat and come down here. And guys, we're going to be doing ministry for this kind of thing. Supernatural sanity is coming to you today in the name of King Jesus. Come on. Are you going to tell me there ain't nobody in here that has been fighting this? There ain't one person that, what are you scared of? You gonna go out of here tormented with all kind of hell because you're scared of what somebody's thinking about you? Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He will heal your mind. He will set you free. He will stop that voice and then you will turn to see his voice. Friends, over the next few minutes, we're gonna be praying for people. If you're a first time visitor, I want you to come in there. But guys, let me just tell you, the Spirit of the Lord is here. Jesus is here today, my friends. Hallelujah. Blessing and peace on you in Jesus.